rules for anyone who missed them. Uh, please keep your microphones muted and your videos off for the duration of the talk. At the end, you'll be able to unmute and ask questions and have a chat. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking our sponsor for our lunchtime talks for the month of July, Terracord Geospectral Imaging. Thank you for your continued support. Okay, so today we have Benedict Steiner joining us to tell us about exploration techniques for LCT pegmatites. Ben is the MSc Program Director of Exploration and Mining Geology at the Camborne School of Mines, UK, and a consultant to the mining industry, industry through Explore Global Limited. Ben started his career in regional petroleum exploration in the Eastern FSU, that's the former Soviet Union, before moving back, on, back to work on Rio Tinto's exploration uranium, copper, uranium and copper exploration projects in Southern Africa, developing best practice. More recently, he carried out projects in Argentina, France, Myanmar, Mozambique, Rwanda and Sierra Leone. Ben has authored a number of scientific papers focusing on the integration of geochemical and other geoscientific techniques in order to aid exploration targeting. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ben. Over to you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, and I'd like to straight uh, dive into uh, the talk. And today we're going to talk about um, exploration techniques for LCT pegmatites. And I will be uh, given a number of examples uh, from African and European prospects or deposits. So let me go to the next slide here. Yeah, um, what is the, actually the relevance of this talk? Well, uh, in terms of pegmatites, they have always been quite an interesting academic phenomenon. Um, and that's because they, they are host to a number of uh, uh, gemstones, gemstone minerals, and um, have always um, in, inside the interest of uh, the academic and the geological community. Um, however, they are known also to form important hard rock lithium and coltan, and that is niobium tantalum deposits, which are used in the uh, high tech. Um, industries. They also form important industrial mineral deposits such as um, quartz, pure quartz resources, feldspars and micas. Um, so they have a, a significant um, um, economic, uh, economic uh, remit. Um, LCD pegmatites, they have seen a spike of interest, particularly uh, between 2014 and 2018. Maybe you remember that uh, during that time, the so-called uh, um, battery re revolution, um, if you want to call it like that, um, started to kick off. Um, however, that sort of plummeted a bit in uh, the last few years, mainly because more and more um, producers, particularly in West Africa, have come uh, online and um, have partly flooded the market with, uh, with these uh, metals and minerals. So um, another important point to mention is that most, if not all of the research that's, that is carried out and has been carried out on pegmatites is uh, usually focusing on ore genesis and the occurrence of these uh, geological bodies. So that means, um, people try to explain how um, the uh, pegmatite phenomenon um, um, came about. However, um, in my opinion, there are only a very limited number of case studies published on actual exploration techniques and targeting. So the techniques that uh, industry and companies are um, applying in real life to um, look for these uh, geological bodies and these deposits. And that's exactly um, what I want to focus on today, uh, the practical applications of LCT pegmatite exploration. So maybe we should start off quickly with uh, uh, defining what are LCT pegmatites. Well, LCT stands for lithium cesium tantalum and uh, pegmatites, um, maybe you remember that from, uh, from uh, your profession or from uh, your degree times, uh, they are very coarse um, uh, crystalline rocks and they are characterized by an abundance of um, 
of minerals that show skeletal, graphic, and other strongly directional growth habits, like you can see on the left, on the left um, image there. The pegmatites are also characterized by uh, prominent sonation. Um, so you can um, observe core zones, uh, quartz core zones, intermediate zones, and uh, wall zones. Uh, but it's, um, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to have uh, sonation. That's, uh, that's one of the points that um, is important to understand. Uh, importantly also is um, the, how, how scientists try to explain the occurrence of pegmatite. And there are a number of um, camps, let's say, um, of scientists who believe in one or the other um, um, origin of these deposits. There's one camp who's arguing that pegmatites forms um, and, and is definitely related to an S-type granite bluton in the vicinity. And the pegmatites are sourced from, from such blutons. And there are other um, scientists and groups of scientists who believe that uh, pegmatites is uh, entirely a uh, migmatitic event uh, that related that that formed um, and and came about through the anatexis of um, of crustal rocks. However, I'm not going to go into this um, heated discussion. I, if you if you're interested in this, I uh, advise you to read up um, the London 2018 paper and the Müller et al. 2017 paper. Um, they discuss uh, quite extensively uh, both models. Um, but we are going straight in and talk uh, today about um, mineral exploration techniques. So what are the fundamental exploration problems that we are facing as uh, practicing geologists in the field uh, when it comes to um, finding and assessing pegmatites? Uh, well, there are thousands of LCT pegmatites in the world thousands of them and they occur in most geological environments but uh, some are suitably enriched in in incompatible uh, and economically interesting elements but they are not economic per se that it allows extraction through open pit methods for example but why is this well first of all and the biggest problem in my opinion is that uh, mostly um, the grade in these pegmatites is irregularly distributed. Like in other um, uh, narrow vein deposits like tin loads or uh, um, orogenic gold deposits, we're facing, the, we're, we're facing the nugget effect. And that is a particular problem um, in assessing a pegmatite. Um, and it also requires us to adopt a number of uh, sampling techniques, for example, that, have, that are, have been commonplace in, for example, the gold industry for, for a long time. Another problem is that um, silicate ore and gang mineralogy um, is often difficult and challenging to distinguish visually. Uh, I believe that if you have for example, lithium micas, and you're talking about uh, I don't know, biotites and symboldites, um, unless there's a, a significant color difference, I personally find it difficult to, to keep them apart. And it requires other methods to investigate um, whether we're talking about lithium enriched minerals. Um, and I will talk about some of these techniques later on. Lithium is also a light element, and therefore it cannot be detected by uh, X-ray uh, fluorescence uh, and portable X-ray fluorescence, and even some mineralogical techniques such as scanning electron micros microscopy. But it can be detected by um, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, that's called LIPS. And nowadays they even have um, produced uh, LIPS handheld devices. I haven't used any of them myself, but um, from what I hear is that um, if you're walking around with such a LIPS analyzer, 
uh, it, it can be quite helpful in, um, in detecting um, these uh, metals of interest. Uh, pegmatites are usually narrow geological bodies, and by that I mean maybe 15 to 20 meters wide. I'm showing you a couple of photos in, in the next slide. So they're narrow geological bodies, but they are laterally extensive and can extend for uh, several kilometers. Now that, uh, if you think ahead a bit in the, in the mining value chain, that creates um, quite a few problems. Uh, because at some point, your stripping ratio, if you open pit mine it, will be uh, quite high. And uh, that will sort of, um, um, they, they can kill your project if, um, if that hasn't been assessed properly. That is particularly relevant in mountainous areas. Uh, for example, in Rwanda, I've been working there for a couple of years, and um, all across that central eastern African district, um, the, such um, uh, um, such problems they they have resulted in a number of geotechnical issues as well. And last but not least. Most of the LCT pegmatites that we're interested in and exploring for, unless they're sort of outcropping as beautifully as, it, as they do in Namibia, they are usually under, under um, residual or transported cover. I just think about the tills in Canada, transported overburden in, in Australia, or just um, good old jungle in uh, Western Africa, Western Central Africa. Maybe see in the background image that's uh, an Im that's doing LCT pegmatite exploration in West Africa, and the area is covered with a tropical rainforest, which uh, gives you considerable issues and call for the you know for some of the exploration techniques that that we're familiar with. So with that said, um, I would like to move on and and um, present to you a couple of the techniques that, that, that are commonly used, uh, that, that we can use for um, defining specifically uh, prospective areas um, from a green fields exploration point of view. So uh, first and foremost, field and geological and rock observations are clearly uh, still the number one uh, exploration technique. If you are able to uh, recognize a pegmatitic rock and perhaps even recognize some of the uh, interesting minerals um, that we are after, then that's already a, a big bonus. In this photo here, uh, you can see a, a, a quite a beautiful um, kaolinized pegmatite in Rwanda. Um, there are some people standing there in the bottom of the pit. So we can see the, the extent of this pegmatite is probably 15, 20 meters max. And artisanal miners are extracting uh, mainly um, coltan from this, uh, from this source here. As it is in Eastern Central Africa, um, there has been extensive um, tropical weathering and that really um, destroyed all the um, felsic minerals in there. It is kaolinized, it's, it's, it's very clay rich, so artisanal miners can just dig it out uh, with uh, very cheap uh, methods. Um, what you should also note in, uh, in pegmatite exploration is the um, occurrence of uh, country rock rafts within the pegmatite. You can see some uh, mica schist is just in the middle of the pit. And this, of course, leads to internal dilution. So if you mine that whole um, pegmatite, you're, you need to know where's the waste rock. And since pegmatite mining is not selective mining, it will always be mined as a bulk rock. Um, you, you have to really understand where are the uh, mineral sonations, where the, the, the minerals occurring and what, are, what is the internal dilution looking like. Um, this ne the next photo here is in, in the similar district. You can see the mountainous area of uh, Western Rwanda. Um, these pegmatites, they, they 
have a lateral strike of several kilometers and artisanal miners have have uh, started to excavate some of these uh, pegmatites in this photo but they stopped after about uh, digging for 30 meters or so and that is uh, largely an, uh, related to due to the stripping ratio they had to strip back more overburden than they could get access to the ore and also because of uh, geotechnical issues as the um, the wall rocks there would collapse all the time so um, I hope you can see where I'm coming from that even in the early stages of such uh, exploration you need to understand what are the next steps even if you outline such a deposit what else do you need to consider uh, in this location um, we went uh, that that's also in the Ruhanga area um, a team of geologists and I I think it was in 2017 early 2017 we went into in the western part of Rwanda and we looked at um, dozens of pegmatite fields and we tried to um, determine which ones now are the interesting pegmatites. Remember what I said, there are thousands of LCT pegmatites, but not all of them are good, are, are good for further uh, production. And one technique that we used to uh, assess the, quickly assess the, um, the feasibility of, 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 these, of these pegmatites was to use a portable XRF and um, calculate some of the pathfinder ratios that are commonly used in LCD pegmatites such as potassium over rubidium. We could clearly see that some of the LCD pegmatites are clearly more fractionated and more um, enriched than others. Um, what my colleague is uh, analyzing here is not just any rock, it's actually large flakes of muscovite. Okay, and it's perfect in muscovite to measure the potassium rubidium ratio. That's what scientists have done for a number of years in laboratory studies. But if you have good enough uh, muscovite and other mica grains, you can um, apply this in the field straight away as well. And that brings me to the next topic of uh, geochemical exploration, along with along with um, field observations, visual field observations, being able to apply geochemical exploration techniques is highly important. Now, uh, as I said just now, um, the idea of using fractionation ratios such as potassium, rubidium, niobium, tantalum, and zircon hafnium, that's, that's not new. It's been done for at least three decades and um, it's been mainly used on whole rock geochemistry um, and mineral geochemistry, for example, of, of micas or feldspars. Now, why are these ratios so important? Well, um, they all describe to some extent the, um, the degree of magmatic fractionation that happened in your, in your uh, magmatic system. And that is because uh, rubidium will substitute for potassium if you uh, fractionate your uh, melt um, uh, strongly enough, right? So the more you fractionate your melt, the more you um, integrate rubidium into the crystal lattice of, of these micas, for examples, for example, and that will decrease the um, that will decrease the the ratio. As it's a similar thing with niobium and tantalum. Um, they are usually coexisting in columbite and tantalite, but tantalum is usually a lot more uh, soluble in melt than niobium is. That means that at the later stage of your uh, melt development and fractionation, tantalum will usually enrich, so it will decrease your uh, ratio as well. Um, but the point that I want to make here is that, uh, to my knowledge, in the, in the last two decades, there has no one uh, gone and tested these ideas on exploration type geological media such as um, soil samples or stream sediment samples. Everything was done on whole rock uh, samples or um, um, mineral chemistry. 
So um, I set out a few years ago and wanted to develop a number of these case studies that show that indeed you can use these ratios, and especially if you uh, plot them in comparison with uh, lithium, cesium, tantalum, tin, for example, um, and um, 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 and I've shown that that um, these ratio can be employed uh, for for stream sediments and soils. That is particularly the case because um, particularly the case because. Uh, Niobium and tantalum uh, form heavy minerals, and um, these heavy minerals they tend to enrich in stream sediment samples, and they're immobile enough to not um, to not weather away when you produce residual or transported soils. All right, um, another technique that is of interest is um, uh, principal component analysis and um, dimension reduction techniques. Those techniques that allow to uh, filter out important signals from, uh, from your geochemical data set. And um, in this example here that I'm showing, and if you that I'm showing, uh, you can see that the uh, loadings of the first and second principal components, they show different trends, such as um, a trend that is uh, showing correlations between niobium, tantalum, beryllium, rubidium, and um, that's usually quite characteristic for these uh, felsic systems that uh, enrich um, the, the late stage uh, magmatic minerals. So um, being able to squeeze the data set in a way that um, you extract information and you reduce the noise is quite key in interpreting and generating targets. Uh, and how can we apply this then to, how can we apply this then to uh, say a regional governmental or a, uh, or a commercial data set that a company has. Well, uh, I selected a case study area in uh, southeastern Ireland, uh, in northwestern Europe, and they've um, published a, a full um, elemental data set uh, for covering the Leinster Granite province and the uh, Caradocian volcanic belt. And um, this area is known to contain and, and be host to LCT pegmatites. And they occur along the eastern flank of the Leinster Granite. Here you can see um, the Leinster Granite is in a, in a faint red color. And on, along the eastern flank, you find usually LCD pegmatites intruding along, along uh, um, a structural deformational zone. Now, applying these, these ratios to this stream sedimentary data set allowed me to not only confirm that um, the same catchments um, show prospective um, uh, uh, mineral associations, uh, but also to outline new areas that are a few kilometers further north and also possibly structurally controlled. So for me, it was a good case study to uh, prove the case that we can use these geochemical ratios in, in, uh, in regional exploration. Good, um, let's move on and um, take this case uh, into um, the Archean Greenstone belts of West Africa. Um, a few years ago, must have been as well, 2016-17, um, I received the, a company data set um, of, a, of a firm who explored in the um, in Western Africa, and the original target was actually orogenic gold, right? Greenstone belts, you normally think, yeah, orogenic gold, 
Um, that's what we're going for. And um, you've seen the photo before. It was quite a, quite a covered area. There's jungle. You can't see any geology at all. So the first thing I did was um, I interpreted the geochemical data set in order to produce a bedrock geological map. You can do this by uh, interpreting uh, immobile elements. Some uh, colleagues over in Australia have pioneered this pioneered this technique in in the in the in the Western Australian gold fields, but it also works elsewhere. And um, you can see um, these these green colors in there. They clearly outline where the, the green stones are, and where the surrounding granitic gneissic basement is. However, I thought, well, you know that in greenstone belts you've got um, you've got LCT pegmatites. Just look into uh, Western Australia or into Canada, where this is a common place, where some of the biggest um, LCT pegmatite deposits are. So I thought, well, let's take a look and see if these uh, these pathfinders also work in um, residual soils. Um, so I I did the similar techniques like in um, like I've shown you previously, and I came up with just one sample in uh, the central part, maybe you can see this here, um, where I'm pointing my mouse, my cursor. There was just one point that showed um, evidence for a felsic rock that uh, might have been quite fractionated. Now, of course, that could be quite erroneous, but it took me a while to convince uh, that company to, to, to pull a few trenches there. And after some convincing, um, a shallow, maybe five meter deep trench was constructed and it exposed a beautifully sewn uh, spotium in pegmatite. And uh, this pegmatite then was uh, looked at afterwards by the British Geological Survey. And because they wanted to make a case that, um, a, a, they want to make a case about pegmatites and Archean greenstone belts. Um, so this is definitely something to keep in mind that geochemistry is probably one of the prime exploration tools that, that you can use uh, in a number of uh, scales from regional to camp to uh, deposit scale to understand where pegmatites are located. Uh, moving on a bit from geochemistry, uh, an important technique is um, is uh, mineral identification. So um, one of the cheapest and fastest techniques that is uh, available on the market is X-ray diffraction. And what do you do with X-ray diffraction? Well, you pulverize your sample in a lab and they put it into that uh, analytical machine and it, it's shooting an X-ray on the sample whilst the sample is turning. And uh, from, from the reflection angles, you can calculate uh, the, uh, uh, the unit cell parameters for, for minerals. It's usually what uh, mineralogists do in the lab. And um, you usually get uh, an empty diffractogram. You just get a, uh, this, this black line there. And the mineralogist would go and, and investigate uh, what the corresponding uh, mineral as, um, signatures are and they blot it on top of, of the diffractogram. And uh, XRD usually works uh, best for almost monomineralic um, assemblages. The more minerals you have in your sample, the more of uh, peak overlays you get. You can see this in the two theta range, uh, starting from 20 and then going on to 60. There are many overlaps, particularly with quartz and feldspars. And um, that makes it quite difficult to effectively pick out what uh, mineral you have. So the lower two theta ranges uh, below 20, you can see there are um, quite a few distinct, a few, uh, quite a few distinct uh, mineral uh, spectra, such as uh, albite, that's a sodium feldspar, and trilithionite and lepidolite. Those are 
lithium micas, and the only difference here is the lithium aluminium ratio um, that, that makes them different. So that's that's why they overlap a bit here as well. Um, and why do we do this XLD then? Well, think ahead again. You need to define, and it's actually a requirement for a chalk reporting that you understand what minerals you have present in your pegmatite. And that has a practical reason uh, because very, very early on, you need to inform engineers on the, on the, um, the geometallurgy of, of your deposit. That makes a big difference whether you have a spotumine pegmatite, so a pyroxene uh, pegmatite, or a, a lepidolite pegmatite, and that is, that's a mica pegmatite, because the mineral processing workflows are quite um, different, and it makes a big, big um, impact on further decision making. Um, you should uh, validate your, you should validate your um, XRD, and that can be done by um, geochemistry, by bulk rock geochemistry, or you laser or blade uh, minerals and identify what the rock, comp uh, the rock or mineral composition is. Uh, from a practical perspective, your exploration samples are usually sent for analysis anyway. If you're having the, an appropriate digest like uh, fusion, um, sodium peroxide fusion, you can um, you can identify the, the, the geochemistry of the sample and confirm whether you've, you're having lithium or uh, niobium or tantalum minerals in there. Another technique that I've tried on a regional scale was the use of automated mineralogy. In other words, using an automated scanning electron microscope. And that was used to uh, identify the, the bulk composition of, in this case, stream sediment samples during regional exploration. Um, remember, uh, techniques like SEM, they don't necessarily tell you about lithium, but you can better understand the minerals that are forming the sample. So, um, for example, I've I have in, uh, included here in a rectangle an interesting mineral, and if you zoom into it a bit more, you get uh, to you, you can see this mineral on the left hand side um, with a, a mineralogical reclassification. You see there is uh, cassiterite in blue, columbite, and you've got K feldspar and quartz in there. If you have got such interesting minerals, you uh, need to do a validation as well. And uh, one way to uh, uh, validate is to uh, run a, uh, 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 an individual point and shoot, as it's called, um, identification using an SEM, and that produced that backscattered electron image on the right-hand side. And from there, you can also analyze the, the bulk chemistry of, 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 of the, the points you're uh, shooting at. Now, this validation is always very important. And um, if you study this a bit further, you can then produce hypotheses how um, the mineralization actually formed. Right? So we've got uh, cassiterite and columbite intergrowths. So you may want to think about uh, possible um, late stage hydrothermal alteration, maybe even craisonization. In, in this particular project that I'm worked on there, uh, I found evidence for craisonization in the in the, um, in, in the catchment area. So there are a number of um, processing, processes leading to enrichment of these, of these minerals. Good. Um, so you might have asked yourselves, well, he's talking all the time about uh, geochemistry and mineralogy. What about geophysics? Well, uh, we know that geophysics can be a really valuable tool in in, in exploration and, and it has been used to, um, to, in a great extent, to outline deposits all across the world. But why is, it, why is geophysics not that good for, um, 
or pegmatite exploration. The reason here is very simple. And that is, there are no minerals with the appropriate physical properties in a pegmatite that can form a, a magnetic or an electromagnetic or a geophysical signal. And we're talking about magnetite for uh, magnetic susceptibility, pyrotite as well. And uh, for, for example, um, you want to also have chargeable uh, uh, um, uh, minerals in there, such as clays, for example, if you want to use electromagnetic techniques. So as these minerals are largely lacking in pegmatites, um, it is geophysics is not useful to directly um, target uh, a pegmatite. However, you need to perhaps consider another avenue, how the geophysics can be used. And in this example here, I've got a, I've got an exa a local example of ground geophysics from the Kibaran orogenic belt. And the magnetics doesn't show us where the pegmatites are, but what does it show us? Well, it shows that evidence for at least three large and major deformational phases in, uh, in this particular area. Literally, someone went there to the geology with a big hunting knife and cut, cut the geology apart, as you can see. There's folding and shear zones and all sorts of uh, tectonic um, influence in this area. We went into the field and we recognized that uh, pegmatites are usually uh, trending uh, northwest or north northwest south southeast. Now, having the geophysics um, available, that really helped to put this into perspective because we figured that the pegmatites are intruding along along uh, structural weakness zones. So if you know how to interpret uh, geophysical data sets, you can make sense of what the geology does in your area. Uh, magnetics can be a great help to, um, to uh, um, identify trends and possible strike extensions of, of, of pegmatites. Another interesting example that a colleague of mine has done in Rwanda a number of years ago was he tried to use uh, electrical resistance surveys to uh, aid um, drill site targeting. You can see on the on the right hand side there is a uh, you, the, the, there's a satellite image and the pegmatites are very clear. They are just white colors. They're all kaolinized, um, but my colleague there, he had the idea, well, they're kaolinized, it's clay, so a chargeability technique should be actually working, right? Um, because clays you know, uh, have a particular uh, chargeability signal or resistivity signal, in other words. So an ERT line was, um, was uh, uh, conducted over just uh, perpendicular to the strike of the pegmatite and identified areas of uh, low resistivity. And that of course is the tropical overburden because it's clay rich. And also the pegmatite, which has been crowned truth previously. And you can see it dipping to the west in uh, maybe a 60 degree angle or so. And um, that is only possible because the pegmatite has been weathered and produced uh, material that can be detected by geophysical techniques. So having this, having this, um, this results available, uh, his team was, uh, was able to plot and um, determine how the drill rigs should move in, right? And how the best color should be determined to intersect that pegmatite without uh, drilling blindly in, you know, in this area. Let's move on to remote sensing. Um, Remote sensing is a technique, so using satellite images, uh, is a technique that has been extensively used in arid areas, such as in Namibia or in, you know, in deserts like in um, the Andes for porphyry copper exploration. 
And that's because you generally need uh, arid areas to have it working. So you need to um, be sure you don't have any vegetation because that's disturbing the, the, the absorbance, uh, absorbance signatures. Um, Colleagues in, in, in Spain and Portugal, they've, uh, Cardoso, Fernandez et al., there's an interesting paper out there. They have used uh, a number of publicly available um, satellite imagery, such as Aster, Landsat 5 and 8, and Sentinel 2, to try and um, they develop techniques for recognizing LCD pegmatite signatures. And what's happening usually in remote sensing is you after uh, three factors. You're after uh, ion oxides, um, which tell you about potentially alteration or um, weathering. You're after clay mineralogy signatures. They could be hydrothermal clays, also important for um, alteration and uh, uh, large scale alteration halos. And you, well, those previous two, they are. Um, particularly usable in the visible and the shortwave infrared. However, the um, thermal infrared has been used in this study to look more into the silicate mineralogy. And um, these authors were able to um, distinguish a number of, or they attended to distinguish a number of lithium, um, lithium rich silicates by using the classic band combinations, band ratios, and principal component analysis for noise reduction techniques. And you can see in these images there that um, there are yellow and orange circles. Those are, those are largely uh, operating quarries already. I think they are pegmatite quarries actually. And they were of course able to to detect and map prospective areas in existing open pits. However, in the study, they struggled um, using this public domain uh, remote sensing to go any further, and that's because of a number of reasons again. First of all, even though on the Iberian Peninsula it's quite arid, there was still considerable vegetation, and that influenced your, your um, uh, absorption uh, uh, spectra. Then the, there was an issue with pegmatite dike size versus pixel resolution. Aster, Lanza, they're usually in the range uh, about 30 meters pixel size. Aster is a bit better. Um, but as, as you've seen before in these images, pegmatites are usually quite narrow and there would be a size less than a pixel. So it's quite difficult to actually um, map any of these pegmatites uh, in a greenfields environment. Uh, furthermore, Sentinel-2 doesn't have any thermal bands in the thermal infrared. Um, there was a problem. So if you use Sentinel-2, you need to look more into the, the shortwave infrared uh, spectra. And another problem was that the there was a spectral similarity between the LCD pegmatites and urban and agricultural areas. And it's largely in the shortwave infrared because in agricultural areas, you would expect clays, right? If, if, if a farmer is blowing the field, you get lots of clays and that, you know, can, uh, um, that, that gives you a, a false sickness, a signature, possibly a false positive. So, these researchers are currently working on it and um, they, they want to develop more indices using remote sensing. Perhaps, in my opinion, in future, the ability of using drones and hyperspectral imagery. So not just 10 or 12 spectral bands, but hundreds of spectral bands will really be uh, beneficial in um, getting appropriate resolution and appropriate um, spectral signatures. That said, you also can use handheld, um, handheld um, devices such as uh, PMAS, for example. And if you have core or any other rock, you can uh, analyze the spectral signatures 
um, using using these devices, and that's. Uh, uh, should be a, a tool that uh, is quite recommended if you if you have access to one. Good. So talking about all of these greenfields exploration techniques, uh, let me quickly uh, summarize this and uh, point you towards a paper that has come out last month in in June by um, a colleague at the Geological Survey of Western Australia. They've been heavily working on mineral systems analysis. This is quite a complex slide, I appreciate this, but uh, if you Google up during 2020 mineral systems analysis pegmatites, you can download the paper and they um, really um, advise on which GIS layers, geographical information systems layers, you can use for um, uh, you know, uh, producing models of uh, pegmatite fertility. If you take it a step further, the source pathway trap and modification model, you could produce um, either knowledge-driven or data-driven uh, uh, models. And one um, famous knowledge-driven technique is, is um, uh, fuzzy logic. So you could build your own a uh, uh, fussy overlay for each of these um, processes and then combine them into a, uh, a general fussy overlay and try to uh, define where are the most prospective zones in, in an area. However, be advised that this only works if you have the data available and not every country has um, the data density that uh, Western Australia has, right? So it may work in some countries, but in others it won't. Um, so take this into consideration. Moving on um, from the exploration to the testing phase, um, drilling, of course, is a key aspect in evaluating a deposit. And uh, the point I would like to make here is that uh, during the drilling, Phase, you need to you need to properly spend time and lock the pore. Um, and there are interesting features that you can find out from a, uh, from from core, such as in top image you have a, a quite a clear quartz rich core zone. So we're talking about a zone pegmatite. In the lower image you can see um, a lepidolite rich intersection. Um, it's a bit of a bluish, pinkish uh, mica down there. And also importantly, take a look at the lower intersect. There's also doloritic host rock. Now, remember what I said, these intercalations of country rock create internal dilution. And you need to understand properly where is the dilution occurring. As pegmatites are rarely take the form of pipes, even if they're, um, if they're vertical. They are much more um, uh, anastomosing and uh, interfingering with the country rock. So building a model of how the pegmatite looks like, how it's zoned, how the minerals are distributed is, is critical. But don't forget that the pegmatite will never be selectively mined, okay? Um, it will usually be uh, bulk mined. So understanding the, the nugget effect, the distribution of minerals in the pegmatite is, is important. That's why you need to take a look at the core. An example from Western Africa and Mali, um, I've recently seen an announcement of a company um, drilling and having some seriously good intersects in my opinion, 72 meters at 1.73% lithium oxide. That is, that is a significant intersect, okay? Um, but if you look at, the, if you look at this um, um, cross-section produced here, uh, it becomes clear that these, um, these pegmatites do not seem to be uh, carrying great continuously. There are some large intersects in some of these holes, then if you go further uh, along strike, uh, you, um, you lose the, 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 the great intersect. 
again, this, this is the problem with these nuggety distribution of, 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 of these valuable metals. So you need to be very cautious of, of, of how the, the pegmatite looks like, how it's interacting with the country rock. Another example from Western Australia, the Malinda Prospect um, has a similar swarm of pegmatites modeled here. It was drilled using RC drilling. You can see down there in the chip trace, you've got a nice quartz-rich core zone. Um, but from these drill holes here, there are three in this section. You can see the intersects are different, right? There are, um, different in grade and in, in thickness. So if you deal with such nugget deposits, like with orogenic gold, for example, or tin, um, it's, it's often a challenge to, to, um, get, to get it right with the grade and the sampling. And you need to drill a lot of holes to, um, to, to outline a grade model for the deposit. If you only use a couple of holes and declare a resource, I think that doesn't work really. Um, and that brings us to the question of which is the best drilling technique? Well, you've seen in the earlier images, drill core is ideal because drill core, uh, you can map all the summations, the minerals and everything. But, um, that gives you automatically the issue of um, how do you sample? Do you take a half core? Um, do you take a full core to, to, to beat the nugget effect? Do you saw off um, or cut off a small piece uh, at the side continuously and keep that as archive material? Well, how do you deal with it? And, um, or do you, for example, uh, send half core and then have a, have a, a pulp duplicate produced at the labs. That's something that needs to be decided um, in order to comply with the uh, resource reporting standards. Um, but usually if you use RC drilling, you automatically get a bigger sample because diameters are, are, are larger. And for those of you who've been on the RC rigs, you usually get your two sample bags, your A and B sample automatically giving you the duplicate. And you've got a large sample bag with the, um, you know, with the bulk sample that you then can use for further study or for compositing or for um, uh, uh, doing metallurgical test work. So both of these drilling techniques have their merits, uh, but clearly um, in order to beat these, these uh, sampling problems, uh, probably a combination of RC and D drilling uh, or one or the other could be, could be of interest when you, when you deal with it. That brings us to the question of what are the minimum grade and tonnage requirements for LCD pegmatites? And the numbers I'm giving here, they are from a, a data compilation study by the US Geological Survey a few years ago. Um, it's a public domain paper. Um, I encourage you to take a look at it. And um, they show a number of graphs and it will be quite um, um, obvious that the world-class pegmatites, they have minimum grades of 7 million tons at one weight percent lithium oxide and um, 0 0.01 million tons at 0.1% tantalum oxide. So there's a big difference between the lithium and the tantalum. And it clearly shows that there are much less world-class lithium pegmatites or lithium-rich pegmatites than uh, tantalum-rich pegmatites. Okay, so um, something you should keep in mind. And, and um, of course, these numbers, they can be variable depending on the, on the, on the grade, uh, but as a general number, this, this, this works. So which techniques works and uh, work and which don't? As we've seen today, um, there's a high suitability for geological mapping, mineral recognition, both enhanced specimen and, and automated mineralogy, your rock sampling, and of course your uh, exploration type soils, soil stream and till and 
uh, other geochemistry. So um, the point, however, is that you need to know what you're looking at in the, in the data set. The times are over where you just look into lithium in PPM or percent, or you look into niobium, you're looking into um, uh, ratios and pathfinders that tell you something about the geological process that lead to pegmatite, to the formation of enriched pegmatites. Um, what is less suitable is remote sensing, as we've seen, even though if you have handheld um, handheld devices like PMAS or so, they, they can be quite useful. And uh, geophysics, probably not for direct targeting, but, also, but more importantly for structural and weathering mapping. Good, so to sum this all up and uh, come to a conclusion, um, what are the key factors again? It's geological mapping and mineralogy, sampling and geochemistry, and of course, important aspects such as grade, bulk tonnage, geomechanics, very importantly. Take a look at this left uh, hand artisanal mining there. If you need to be very careful how you, um, how you, you know, produce this tunnel or this, this, this hole, you don't want to risk the, the safety of the workers. So it's something that needs to be kept in mind. Okay, before I then um, open up for Q&A, um, I would like to point you towards uh, a paper that I've written last year, um, describing a workflow for LCT pegmatite exploration. And it goes into great detail, a lot more than we've talked about this past hour about what are the key criteria, how do you build a proper workflow for um, pegmatite exploration. Uh, that's an open access paper, you can just Google it and uh, download it and uh, start reading. With that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for, the, uh, for being part of this lecture today and yeah, I hand over to Natalie. Great. Thank you so much, Benedict, for that really interesting talk. Um, we're going to open up uh, to the floor for questions. If you have a question, you can use the little um, raise your hand function. Otherwise, just unmute yourself and ask Benedict a question. We have a question from George Henry. Thank you very much, Benedict, for a fascinating talk. Um, you mentioned a couple of times the importance of the nugget effect um, when it comes uh, to uh, determining how much lithium or tantalum or niobium there is. Um, to take it one stage further, what geostatistical techniques are people using to calculate uh, these grades and tonnages um, in the pegmatites? I know um, uh, everybody talks about Kriging and all the other fancy just statistical techniques um, uh, and, uh, and uh, are they reliable? Thank well, I, I need to say I'm not a geostatician or, uh, or any of the kind, but what my colleagues have done to my knowledge was, it was used creaking, but I'm, I'm aware that there are different creaking techniques, but I wouldn't be able to tell you the, you know, the details of, of, of the, the parameters they use. Thank you. Sure. All right, uh, we have another question from David Pollard. Um, Benedict, thank you very much for the talk. And in particular, I, I want to specifically thank you that um, it's, there's, there's so much new material that you're talking about compared to your, uh, the paper you published last year. Um, that's really interesting, the, 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 the extra things you've raised. Um, in Nigeria last year, what I discovered was that um, there seemed to be a lack of uh, lithium, uh, um, lithium silicates, with perhaps the exception of um, L-bayite, um, within the top six meters of terrain. And um, I wanted to know whether that's something that you have generally found or whether that was peculiar to 
um, the areas where I was working. I haven't seen that as a, as a general statement. All the pegmites I worked on, they were, even though it was weathered and tropical and in a tropical environment, they were all sort of enriched, it even enriched even further some of these uh, columbites and tantalites and other silicates. So you're, you're, you're finding um, uh, petalite and um, lepidolite and uh, spodumene within the top six meters? In that, in that photo I've shown you, yes, we've, we found that, yeah. Interesting, right. Um, if I may ask a further question, something I, I, I found um, in some particular publication was that in regard to the evaluation of pegmatites, um, that uh, and, and the sampling that one, one is requiring to do, which is obviously need to be as representative as possible, um, the need for the widest diameter drill core uh, possible. Correct. And uh, I think that's why I, I mentioned that RC drilling is probably the best technique. Um, and another reason for that is, remember, pegmatites have quite uh, large crystal sizes if they're developed. And that means that, uh, you know, to evaluate, you need to, need to take this into account. And that is a problem with uh, standard diamond drilling if you do HQ or even lower. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Benedict. No worries. Thanks. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. We have uh, another question from Nicholas um, in the comments. So, Nicholas, you can ask your question. Uh, sure. Hi, Benedict. Thanks a lot for your talk. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All good. Hi, right, thanks. Uh, Benedict, we met some years ago in Aachen. I, I did my master's I there. I remember, yeah. Yeah, nice. Thanks. Ma Benedict, uh, just a couple couple questions. You, you, you spoke about uh, Iberia and Spain and Portugal. Uh, in, in Iberia and, and also in Europe, which type of pegmatites are, are the more common uh, for lithium? Is it the, the, the mica or the, or the spodumene? Um, and it that, really that, depends. Okay. So okay. largely in, in the Iberian belt, you've got the spodumene and Remember, if you go back to Germany, um, well, they're not necessarily pegmatites, but you've got in the Erzgebirge, you've got your mica-rich uh, mica deposits, but that's more crasonized. Okay, mm -hmm. so, but in Iberia, um, there are a lot of interesting papers out there describing the, the spodumene pegmatites, but you also get your, your mica, and it just depends uh, how yeah. each of these individual pegmatites developed. Okay, and and just to follow up, uh, from what I've read, the strip ratio differs quite a bit, right? We see we see uh, typically a higher strip ratio for the spodumene compared to the mica, but also a lower grade lithium grade in the mica deposits compared to the spodumene. Mm. Uh, would you agree with that? Yes. Is that... Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I think and that the real process. Problem... Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just saying, um, processing a, a, a lithium mica pegmatite is is not as straightforward as a as a spodumene pegmatite. So there are a couple of projects in the world that that mm -hmm. deal with lithium micas, and you need to have you know, really a good uh, processing workflow established. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, that's good to know. All right, thanks so much, Benedict. Sure. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, we have another question from George Henry. Uh, um, thanks you, Natalie. Um, Benedict, uh, just out of um, interest, um, these are lithium sourcing from pigmentites. Uh, how do they compare with the minimum requirements for the uh, lithium salts that they mine? Yes, in, uh, yes, yes. Um, um, what are the grades and uh, et cetera? Yeah. I think I've written it. I, I can't. I don't have the the, the exact comparison values uh, at the moment, but I think I've written that in my paper. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, is your paper open source? Yes, it is. You can you can download it. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll do that. Sure. 
All right, thanks, George. We just have a further comment from Fr Francois in the chat. Um, he says, lithium is very fluid. Perhaps that's the reason for the absence of lithium minerals in the upper strat. Any comments there, Ben? Yes, it could, could well be. I think it depends on the, what the weathering is. It could be in David's case in Nigeria, you have uh, you know, intense leaching and um, it, it, it's taken out. Um, when we did in Rwanda some XRD studies, there were still traces of these uh, uh, weathered silicates around. Um, so I think it, 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 it's, it's a local phenomenon. That, that depends on where you where you have your pegmatite. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Benedict. Um, are there any further questions from the from the floor? I don't see any more hands up. Anyone? <laughs> oh, we've got a comment from Michael Con Cronwright. Um, another thing to remember is the effect of weathering on the mineralogy and ability to process. Yes, I can agree. I don't know if this was a question or a comment, but I think it was yeah. just more of a comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much again, Benedict, for joining us um, for that very interesting talk. And thank you once again to TerraCore, our July sponsors. And thank you, of course, to everyone who joined us this afternoon for this talk and have a great Friday further. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you again. Cool. Thanks everyone. Have a great weekend. Yeah, sorry, no, I'm just leaving the meeting. <laughs> it's a Zoom <laughs> meeting. Ciao.